I think we're recording. Great. <laughs> I have the great honor today to interview someone that I deeply admire, the North Korean defector, defender of human rights, and advocate of freedom, Yunmi Park. Thanks so much for joining me today, Yunmi. Thank you very much for having me. I need to say right at the beginning that I read your memoir over the weekend and I was profoundly, oh. <laughs> profoundly moved by it. And uh, it's just a deep gift that you've given to many people by writing that book. Thank you for, thank you so much for reading it because uh, it was a real honor and it, it's, it's been really wonderful to see how many people are getting to know we are North Korea. You know, you say at the very beginning of the book, you have a very provocative statement. You say that you are grateful for two things, mm -hmm. that you were born in North Korea and that you escaped North Korea. I think anyone who's read your book can imagine why you were glad to escape North Korea. But can you say a bit more about why you were grateful to have been born there? I think uh, the one thing that I learned after I came to this safe safety and free word is that you know a lot of people do not know the value of a lot of things you know when freedom was given then you don't know how special it is and it, right now right we are in this quarantine and when things were normal back then we did not appreciate how great the life was actually and it, it is almost like the similar like that when you only have seen the light you don't know how great that light is and when you are truly in the darkest point in your life you find a perspective and you also get to know yourself in a very different way so I think through my journey of course I learned how to survive but I really had to learn what it means to be a human and what it means to live life so without going through all of that there's no way I could have learned that uh, very early on in my life you have a beautiful uh, image early in, in the book about when you're still living in North Korea as a child, when uh, you say the electricity was very inconsistent mm -hmm. and it would just come on mm -hmm. for a few minutes and you talk about how everyone would get up and celebrate in the middle of the night when the electricity would come on. Yeah. The simple, deep joyfulness of that moment mm -hmm. is, is very touching. And you go on to say that it's one of the very few things that you miss about life in North Korea is that mm. even the smallest thing can make you happy. Yeah. Um, how do we cultivate a sense of gratitude and fullness and of human intimacy and connection regardless of our material means? Yeah, I think that it's, uh, now that practice also like applies to me. Now I'm living in this comfortable life where things are abundant, right? And you know, it was really shocked me when I came to the U.S. Uh, the problem that this country had was actually having too much of food. The people think saying like people are on diets and I never in my life, entire le like life learned the word diet. Never went on diet in my life, right? And I came to this world and saying the, you know, number one things that people are dying is like obese and children are suffering from it and so many people suffer from it. And that really like made me think. I never thought like having too much was gonna be a problem. But also uh, here, I mean, some people think it's like a, happiness is a relative thing, right? If everyone is so poor, you have no one to compare. So that's why people here are saying, maybe that's why you're happy in North Korea because you, you had no one to compare to. But I think to me, that's not really true because if the, basic human condition has doesn't meet you know that you are not happy you know that you are suffering like imagine if you were not in a warm warm place even though nobody's in a warm place you know that you are miserable because you are so cold and you know that you're hungry even everyone is hungry that doesn't make you happy because like everyone else is hungry so for that regard i don't think life in North Korea necessarily happier if I see pictures. The biggest thing that I see is that people who live in the free world, they always smile in their pictures. And if you look at 
photos from the Soviet Union time and like North Korea, they all look so, so not smiling. So it's not absolutely like North Koreans are a lot happier than Americans, but they appreciate smaller things more. And they are, you know, I mean, obviously North Korean people don't go to therapy. <laughs> And I was so shocked in New York City when I was living there in Manhattan. It's like the wealthiest part of this our planet. People are so miserable that they, so many people were going to therapists and they asked me to go on. And I, I just couldn't believe like, what is your problem, right? And I think that like, uh, it is almost like comes with the practice. And in North Korea, I think just because we don't have anything that was, uh, good in our life that just seeing the electricity a few seconds or a few minutes just made us like happy like uh, as if it was like Christmas or you know the greatest thing in the world that we have seen. You write about your father planting flowers mm. when that space in the garden could have been given to vegetables. Mm. Why were the flowers in some sense important? I mean were, was it was their value precisely that they were not something you needed in order to live uh, physically. Every inch of land was so important and special that we had to find food somewhere. And if you see even like North Korea, every piece of land that can be become a farm, it's all like farmland already. Um, so yeah, a lot of people say North Korea must be so beautiful. Like there is so much be natural because there's, like, there was no industrialization, but actually not. I never seen that much tree when I came to America and South Korea. In North Korea, we don't even have trees. They cut all like down the mountains and make the farmland. So it was a completely crazy thing that he did to plant flowers, not the you know vegetable or like grains. But he he knew how to celebrate life. He knew the the gift of life that he fought for his life until the last day and. The, the things that he told me was, you know, life is worth fighting for no matter what. And it is a gift that we need to cherish. So he did that to cherish and celebrate life, I think. Now I'm thinking about why he did that. How would you describe what those things are that make life living as you came to understand them? Well... <laughs> Well, in North Korea, there was no world for love for between humans. The only love that was allowed was a written form that we could write down in the notes saying love, but when we only describe the leader and uh, the party. So my mother or my father, my friends never told me that they loved me. But they did love me, just they did not know the words to describe the feelings. And what made life worth living was love. And when I was being bought by this man who used me as a sexual slave, and of course my belly was full by then, I did have clothes to wear, but you know, I had lost that love in life. And I think. I think that's what that's what I meant by what it means to be a human that you know if you are in the most like, luxurious castle with the, everything made of like diamonds and gold and you have the tons of like billions of money but you're alone there I'm sure that person going like, to kill that person like kill himself or, or not that much longer later so we only we are here because of each other right that humans are social animals that we can't even ourselves, we cannot even make a pen by ourselves. We need each other to make a create a pen. And like that, uh, when I was in that situation, I lost all of it. And that's where, when I realized in life, if there's no love, there's nobody that I care for. You know, life is gone. And myself was gone with it. Why do you think that freedom, mm. true, deep, inner freedom, the kind of freedom that all human beings seek, is mm -hmm. impossible without truth. I arrived in South Korea uh, uh, at 15 years old. 
And when I arrived there, people were saying like, oh, you're a teenager, you're a young girl. And, you know, so, and the society was very confucius that, you know, people actually, when they even get married, they get judged if they are virgin or not. And for me to admit that I was raped that many times at 13 and being a sexual slave for two years, there was no hope for me to be married to somebody who is normal and gonna have a normal family life that I, all my life, what I dreamed of was being a normal person. And I couldn't get that. I was not normal because of my experience. But what made me was all those scars, all those trauma. When you go through something that hard, it's not like after you survive, it's not like, oh, you're safe now. It's all gone. Just forget about it. It has written something in your DNA permanently. It's something written in your heart, in your brain. Something is so permanent there that cannot be erased. And I was running from that, you know. I was pretending to be like a normal 15 years old girl in South Korea to, you know, try to pretend to sing like K-pop songs and, you know, speak like South Korean kids. But that wasn't me. And I was living a lie. And, you know, this, this like, truth comes down to me at night, especially when I'm dreaming. I was never in South Korea. I was always in, in North Korea and sometimes in China running from the like police. And I think uh, when you are not accepted as who you are fully, that you know that you are not living your own life. You are living somebody a lie with somebody else's life. And it was, it is sad because in, in my time in South Korea, all my time in South Korea, I lived with somebody else's life. The person that I tried to be, like created this image of a person that was like normal, didn't go through anything bad. And once I fully realized, in, like, no, that's not me and embraced my scars, I truly at peace with my past and present and you know, my future right now. You write in the book that the more you remembered your past, the more your heart was filled with purpose. Mm -hmm. And this amazing and beautiful book is the result of your doing that. Yunmi, do you think that our darkest and hardest moments are also the place of our most beautiful possibilities? Absolutely. It's, uh, it, at least I hope to believe that it was for me like that, I think. But, you know, I did go through something that I don't wish anyone to go through. I obviously certainly don't want my son to go through that. No one I know, I want them to go through what I went through. But for me, it was. But I also know that uh, when somebody who does not able to come out from it and break, I don't blame them because... For instance, my sister chose a path of uh, forgetting about her thing and never talk about it. She also went through something so unspeakable in China for seven years. And the reason that you don't see a lot of North Korean defectors who speak up, whenever you see about North Korea on the news, like CNN, BBC, or like these uh, Western scholars talk about North Korea, not the North Korean people coming out, speaking up, because because of exact the reason that they can't, they can't make a piece out of that. They cannot comprehend what they went through, make a sense and make a meaning out of it. And it is not their fault that they are not speaking out and being truthful. Sometimes it is actually better to be not revisiting it again and moving forward. And I completely respect my sister and a lot of other people that I know that choose a different path. But my case, I had enough support for me to realize that I am loved, that I am worthy of love. I wasn't dirty. I wasn't a worthless person because I went through it. And just I had a, such an amazing group of support. But without that, I think I would break too. So I think when someone go through it, for them to have the beautiful result, it is so essential that they have that support from hit the surrounding groups that you know 
people next to them to love them and like give them this like encouragement. You're clearly your mother and father are both uh, deeply important in the in the foundational making mm -hmm. of of who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. You say early in the book that your your mother and father encouraged you uh, to be proud of who you are. Yeah. That that uh, that comment is is parallel with one nearly at the end of the book where a South Korean immigration official speaks mm -hmm. down to you in a demeaning way implying mm -hmm. that you were to blame for your sufferings and, and couldn't be expected to amount to anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, by contrast, in that shortly thereafter, when you were finally admitted to, when you were finally admitted to, I'm not sure to say, Dong, Dongguk University, yeah. mm -hmm. you say, I put my face in my hands and wept. Someone, finally someone believed in me. In me, what goal, does the gaze of others, whether whether loving or judgmental, whether encouraging or demeaning, play mm -hmm. in what we can become? When I was in China, uh, I worked in this uh, thing called uh, a webcam girl. And I was uh, 14 years old. And for us, that was way, way better option than become a prostitute that you are not actually physically being touched. And in China, there was no other way to survive. That we could not get a job. We, we could not, like, our dream was, like, can we at least go wash dishes in the restaurant so that they don't, the authorities don't capture us and send us back to North Korea and, like, we can find some, like, leftover food. We don't even need the money. We don't need anything. Just like let us just like wash this so you can find some like scrap, you know, some food to in the restaurant. And that wasn't even allowed. Only thing was for us to be in these dark places, being violated and being abused and being being bought by these brokers or being prostituted or being a webcam among the three. It was the best thing being we, we could do was being a webcam girl where we were not being touched physically. Uh, we met a later person from South Korea who wanted to re help us to rescue us to South Korea. Uh, we told him uh, about our past. He found out about what we did to survive in China. And he said that like, we were sinners. We are dirty as, uh, as dirty as it can get and then we can never be renewable. And in that moment, I think it was, I never knew that like the blame was gonna be on the victims. So they, no one blamed for this man who were raping us. No one saying those people were like dirty, that they blamed the victims who went through this, not by their choice, not by you know their fault. So, and in South Korea, of course, everyone viewed me like, uh, you know, as soon as I tell them I'm from North Korea, they say, you know, are you a spy? Why are you talking to me? Why are you like speaking so weird way? Because South Korea and North Korea has different accents. And I wasn't even allowed to like go to a lot of public places because I wasn't speaking like you know, South Korea. And even though I have South Korean citizens, they say, yeah, we don't allow foreigners to be in this like place. But, you know, all it took was just few people who believed in me, you know, who, who cared about me. And that was my mother who was always by my side. And later the university that chose me. And later I came to America and I met also a few people who, who believed in me. So, you know, you don't need to like everyone to believe yourself. You know, I have a, a, a country, I have a, a regime that goes against me right now. But I think all we need is that few connection, that deep connection that we can find in life. It doesn't have to be your parents, but it can be anyone. And one of the strongest support that I have right now is like a gay brother that I met when I came to America in the first few times I came. And he just like hugged me. And I was so shocked that like, why this guy hugging me? And he said like, oh, don't worry, baby, I'm gay. It's like, what the heck is he talking about? Like, what is gay? So I had to go back to my hotel room and Google the gay. I was like, oh my God, that's why he meant because in Norway we don't have gay. And from that day, he 
was like my stepbrother and always like believed in me. And that really helped me to recover my faith in humanity and recover, you know, all that things that I lost before. So, yeah, it, it, is, it, it isn't that hard, I think, to, you know, and also always like being just uh, positive about her thing. You, you write when you were trapped in China that you were not able to have pity for anyone, including yourself. But then later when you were free, you say you were mm -hmm. only able to have compassion for yourself by mm -hmm. having compassion for someone else. You never speak of yourself or never seem to think of yourself principally as a victim, as if you are simply passively defined by those experiences. What advice do you have for other people who are, who are victims? <laughs> well, I mean, what uh, for me is, I mean, like, I do consider myself to be the luckiest person that has ever lived in this earth. Because otherwise, it's, there's no mathematically speaking why I have survived and not the others. It's not like I fought harder than others or I did something differently than others. I just got lucky. And there are right now only 207 North Korean defectors in America. Over 75 years, only 207 have made it to this far. So what is the mathematically like percentage for a person to make it from North Korea and all the way here? And, and I learned English and like wrote a book and being able to speak out, not have been killed by Kim Jong-un already. So for that regard, I'm so lucky. But the thing, I think it's like, as I said, though, you know, if you do start self pity, there is no end to it. So, so it's like oh well, like if you keep digging, digging, it just goes and then there's like never ending to the self pity, and that was the first thing I stopped with my own sister when she was starting that. I was like, no way you can do that to yourself. You know, you're just not allowed. Like think of how ridiculous you are. So lucky that you have met us again and you survived. And I think, but that is different from being compassionate and loving yourself. It was really difficult for me to love myself and accept myself. But without me being compassionate towards myself, I cannot be doing that to others. Like, look at me, I'm such a mess. And when someone else make a mistake, if I know how to forgive myself, I can forgive others too, because I know that we are all human beings. And so I think that's something, you know, not blaming or not like self-pitying and being compassionate is very, very different thing because compassion, comes with the gratitude, you know, comes with like acceptance and like looking out. But when the self-pity is really coming from bitterness and looking inwards, it really going down, like not like looking out. So just, that's like what I really like separate when I, when it comes to my past and when I still have nightmares, when I wake up, instead of saying like, oh, I had such a bad night, like, I, like I'm shivering, it's so like, my mood is so down, then like, thank God I woke up in different place than North Korea, thank God. You know, when you, like, when you, some people say like they live in the simulation, right? I had that with me, the delusion for so long because I couldn't believe that I was safe after that long. So I thought, what if like, my I'm like in my dream and dreaming about me me being different place and I just keep pinching myself many 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 times when I arrive in South Korea just afraid that to be a dream like what if like when I wake up from this wonderful dream that I'm gonna wake up in North Korea in my cold room in like with my hungry stomach so you know if you think that like that's the perspective you get that perspective that you, there's no way you can be bitter about what you went through and where you are right now. You write about how you had to withdraw in order to survive. Yet, of yeah. course, really to live means to engage mm -hmm. with what is around you. And yeah. you write about one night just before you and your mother embark on your, your escape through the Gobi Desert uh, into South Korea, into Mongolia, sorry, from China. Mm -hmm. And about hearing your mother sing that night. And I'm going to read yeah. this beautiful passage, you say, I'm not much of a singer, but I've always loved my mother's voice. 
When I was young, she sang to me while she was cleaning the house or putting me to sleep. Her voice was the most beautiful, warmest sound I'd ever known. Hearing her sing again broke down a wall I had built around my heart. For nearly two years, I'd felt like all five of my senses were numbed. I could not feel, smell, see, hear, or taste the world around me. If I had allowed myself to experience these things in all their intensity, I might have lost my mind. If I had allowed myself to cry, I might never have been able to stop. So I survived, but I never felt joy, never felt safe. Now, as I listened to my mother sing the old songs, that numbness melted away. I was overwhelmed by the boundless love I felt for her and also the intense fear of losing her. That sense of dread hollowed out my chest like a physical pain. She was everything to me. She was all I had. Would you like to say something else, Yunmi, for us about music or song or other experiences that open us up from a world from which we have withdrawn uh, and open us up into being able to experience it again? Well, I never been to museum when I was in North Korea. <laughs> I never knew uh, what philosophy was, what anything was. But for me, in my journey of feeling things again, right? When I remember very first time when I was being raped, I was like literally living on my own body and just looking down at myself and keep telling, oh, that's not me. And keep saying like that was not me, that who was being raped. And after that, I had this somehow in a weird way that keep saying that that wasn't happening to me and like separating my somehow self and the, my physical self. So that was like what I was doing too in, in, in South Korea too. Like, oh, that wasn't me. I believe that, was, that wasn't me. And that was only way for us, me to survive in China was not feeling things, not allowing me to feel anything. But I think, yeah, the, for me, the music definitely helped uh, to hear her singing. And because that, when I listened to her, her songs before when I was a child, that I was in a place where of I was safe and loved. So bringing that back, those feelings very easily, you know, that music can transfer the things that words and other things cannot do. And the other things that really helped me was reading, that reading really made me feel like I wasn't alone in this world. And, you know, you read and to know that you are not alone and you read so many you, you live through so many thousand different lives when you read something, right? You can, you live my life actually by reading my book. And when I read other people's books, I live their life. And living that so many lives of others, it really helped me to understand I was not alone in this. So I think I, for me, it was really good to have that access to books and music that, you know, I was not allowed to have in North Korea. It's another very, very uh, illuminating moment in the in the book when you you write about your your how you simply devoured books when you got to South Korea. You say you inhaled books like other people breathe oxygen, not yeah. reading for knowledge or pleasure, but to live. Even if I was hungry, books were more important than food. You read Tolstoy and Shakespeare and <laughs> uh, George Orwell. Um, you say that you were starting to realize that you can't really grow and learn unless you have a language to grow within, and that you could literally feel your brain coming to life as if new pathways were firing up in places that had been dark and barren. Reading was teaching me what it was to be alive, to be human. That's such a beautiful account of how reading can bring us to self-knowledge. In a way, it's the counterpart to what you say about compassion, that only by understanding another can we understand ourselves. Mm -hmm. And in a way, by looking outward at others, we can look inward and understand ourselves. I, I almost see books like, like lights. Mm -hmm. There are things we can't see without them. They illuminate places that we, it would be dark to us. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to say about reading uh, and about the, the freedom that we can come to 
in a way only in books? I mean, because the when you read, you know, a lot of books, it's not like the meaning was never defined by, right? There's no, uh, there's like and the like never ending possibility of interpretation by your lived on experience and your current present. So even when we read the Torah story, uh, I was started reading Anna Karenia the other day and based on your living experience and where you are currently, everyone's gonna be interpreting gonna be so different. And that's why when you read a book, it's like, it becomes your story. It doesn't become any, everybody's story, it's yours. And I think that's why it's like your own very special thing that you own being like and embodying yourself with that story. So it is, you know, I think especially people who went through something alone when they're especially young, they always feel like I'm alone. When I was crossing the Gobi Desert to Mongolia, it was like minus 40 degrees and I never seen desert in my entire life. And I remember still standing on that night, looking like out, like looking front, side, backwards, everywhere looked the same. There was no one single tree, nothing tells me where I am in this world. Just everything was like all the same. And I was so afraid, like, how do I know I'm going straight? I might go circle, circle, circle in this, right? And in that moment, I felt like even this universe abandoned me here. Not just only the people, but just the universe abandoned me. But for me to know that I wasn't alone and that I am connected to others is like really through the books that even the people who live like many centuries ago, they also are connecting me. And that's how we are all connected. And I never felt like abandoned again by this universe and by everyone else, obviously. Yeah, it shows the the universality of our human experience. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking freely and independently is, is, is not easy. I mean, we always like to think that it's someone else who is indoctrinated or someone else that is yeah. being ideological. It's not, our, it's, it's not us, it's yeah. that person so ideological, uh, yeah. we might think. Um, <laughs> as you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher, and so I'm very interested in how an individual comes to a more and more adequate a, a deeper understanding of themselves and the world. We, of course, don't have uh, state propaganda, um, but that doesn't mean that we're immune from ideology. To mm -hmm. the contrary, we're, we're immersed in, in all kinds of black and white thinking uh, all of the time about uh, politics, about culture, about mm -hmm. the West, about power. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, how do we come to the truth in such a way that it's not just another form of ideology. How do we know when we're really onto it, that we're, 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 we're getting towards the bedrock and the bottom line of what's really real? <laughs> I think, though, I'm not sure I read like Korean trans version of Socrates when I was freshman. And he said, I think Socrates was asking someone like, how do you know that you know this? And and it's like, you know, I know this, but he said, I'm wiser than you. And they ask, why do you think you're wiser? Because at least I know that I don't know. <laughs> and I think to me, that is the essence of it, that when you realize that you are biased, no matter what you do, you are going to be biased in some ways. And nothing is black and white in this world. There, everything is complex. Never Things are never like bad and good like that. Even the man who bombed me in China let me go two years later. That's how complex humans are. And that's why I can never say, oh, that was a monster, even though I thought he was a monster. And I think that's like we need to realize that we got to realize that we don't know. But most of people think they know, right? They know exactly what's happening. They know why exactly it is. And that's when it becomes very, uh, to me, dangerous. Because I think Kim Jong Un feels like he knows what to do, and he think he thinks he knows every answer to everything, but of course he has no idea what he's doing, and most of us have no idea what we are doing. But for us to realize that and being flexible with that, 
think that is really for me that was very important when I read that verse. I was like, oh, I think I just learned everything I had in college. <laughs> so you've made this amazing journey. Do you sometimes look at at, at a fellow Americans or other Westerners and think, what are you doing? You don't you don't see how precious what you have is, or yeah. what are your thoughts on on those matters? What I learned was when I thought when I go to freedom, a free country, that I. I thought every was everybody was gonna be open minded and not labeling things. Right? They would not say, Oh, you're this. Like let's say, Oh, you're a Democrat or you're being conservative or you're libertarian. Like it's very in America, right? Like there's like certain a certain box you have to belong to. And if you don't belong to that box, like they everyone like trashing you out. Especially when I'm doing like, being a human rights activist, that like, uh it is a uh, I had to learn like what politically correctness was here. And it was like, so it was so shocking because I thought I was done with that in North Korea. And now, I mean, in a very different degree here, you still know I'm going to execute you, even if you're not polit- being politically correct. But being in media, I definitely learned it isn't like everyone is absolutely open-minded here too. And they are you, you a lot of people do get emotion you can never have intellectually cool you know not very emotional like debates to a lot of times it's sadly and you know i went to colombia in new york and it was so sad like you know if if you don't feel comfortable you can leave the place and i do really respect that but a lot of times that it is really my hard feeling is like after graduating from the American University now, it is just very different, like it's not censorship, but very different form of not being able to express yourself fully because of there are so many judgments comes from it and you can be judged to not being sensitive enough, right? And also you can be just not knowing the history enough. Like my case, I wasn't born in this country. I didn't go to middle school, high school, any of that. So I can make way more mistakes than Americans themselves. And and I think that's what scares me too right now. But I know like I shouldn't be scared of this. Like this is a free, you know, free democracy. I should be able to say anything. And if I did it wrong, I should be apologized and everyone should get over it. But it is nice. I know it's going to haunt me because of the internet age. It's going to follow me forever and ever. So it is a very ironic situation that I, I see. And also I see a lot of the developed democracies of doing that. So I don't know where we are going to go head towards. But definitely it's not a, I think, great thing that we have. We have to be so sensitive to what we are saying. You write about your time in Songnam Ri. Yeah. Amidst your father's imprisonment, being sent to live with your aunt mm. uh, in the middle of a, of a very rural mountain town where yeah. people were still living uh, a very ancient way of life with little mm. electricity and ox carts next to the yeah. pure mountain springs, traveling at night by moonlight. Yeah. You write, even while I was there, I couldn't help feeling a strange nostalgia for the simpler way of life in Songnam Ri. I don't know how else to explain it, but all these new experiences seemed deeply familiar. Up in the mountains, surrounded by nature, I felt closer to my real self than at any other time I have known. In some ways, it was like living in ancient Chosun, the long-ago Korean kingdom I had heard about from my little grandmother in Kowon. I think she had the same yearning for a place neither of us had known that existed in old song, only in old songs and dreams. Do you think that amidst the noise and busyness of life, mm-hmm. that we are forgetting something essential about ourselves, about our need for contemplation and a connection with our own deep past? I mean, are we in danger of our own kind of materialist and busyness prison? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, that's, it is, I do think sadly, yes, I do. It is crazy, right? Even now, I dream of going home. I dream of going back to North Korea. I never left the country because I hated my country. I 
I was hungry and I didn't like the system. Not because I hated my people or the culture or the country. And it is very hard to be connected with my own self, with all so much distractions, right? How many newspapers you need to check every day, like the internet and the phone and text message and everything that I had done with the human connection was in person with somebody there. Smell them, see their, you know, every wrinkles, every day expression they were making. It wasn't through the emojis, you know, it wasn't through just like a, like a video, it's like a very flat screen. It was seeing a real human and living life with a real person every day. And of course, I never had the suitcases. We never traveled. We never needed that many things. Like even when I was escaping from North Korea to China, right? I was moving the country permanently. I had no suitcase whatsoever. I had just everything that I wore on my body. That was all I had. Even going to Mongolia, I never knew like when you travel, you needed a suitcase. And in Songnam too, like we never leave the clock. We we use the chicken like rooster in the morning wakes up, you know. We see the sun when it rise and go back. And we never needed any you know, water bottle. We just go look at the stream on the side. You can just drink the water from the stream, like a stream, seeing the wild berries and just eat it from the nature. It, it is a very ancient way, right, of living life. But I do miss it. And if I do get a chance, if the work, if my people are still stop being abused by the dictator and being a free country I would want to live that life again like without that way I do think I am completely connected with myself and humanity you know life is like what you are experiencing in your own head isn't it like our life is our head right we are living in our head always and it is very important for me to what kind of place in my head it's gonna be for me at least and like that was like what delusion it was for me like it doesn't matter if you're in prison or in like in a fancy hotel room or anywhere you know what matters like what is going on in your brain and depending on that you can have the best experience of your life or the worst experience of your life and that's what i realized that i do live in this like skyscraper like chicago but you know i don't know like if i'm that much happier than like having nothing and being so in nature. But also the funny thing is that, you know, I don't know if I now go, I go back. I will feel the same way, but I do miss definitely being, um, being with myself that way and being near that close to uh, with other people that way without any intervention of technology for sure. One of the things that comes again and again through your story is your deep sense of purpose even in very dark moments, you know, to, to, when you have nothing else to, to reunite your family, to find mm. your sister, to provide for your mother, to seek medical care for your father, in what you've described today as a, a life that is, is, is very comfortable and materially stable and safe uh, uh, in Chicago, um, how do you live with the same sense of purpose as you had before? Well... Uh. I don't know almost like why I cannot just like be okay with what what it is now and like forget let go of the past. But uh, my case, my my purpose now is that because I spoke out against the regime, uh, three generations of my family has been banished in North Korea. So I'm very you know, very sorry to hear that. No, but for me to have this voice right now. So many people had to die for me to be free. And I literally paid so much price with real lives for me to be free. And I know the true meaning of freedom. It is not free. And you think, I mean, a lot of people think here like freedom is free, but it is not. And I think that is almost sometimes the reason why I survived for me to remind the people that how precious this freedom is and what life can, can be like without freedom. Because North Korea sometimes, I'm not like, I don't believe in like one like specific God what people say, right? I'm not a like, Christian, I'm not, you know, Buddhist. I'm like, I'm very spiritual, but 
almost if there there is God, I think He left North Korea to remind all of us that this is what life can be without freedom. This is the perfect example of without freedom, how humans are gonna be treated and how they're gonna live. And that is what I wish the world learned from North Korea and North Koreans that they must fight for freedom no matter what, above anything they have. It is the most precious thing that we have as a human race. And another reason that I think why I survived is to, you know, because I know what it means to be forgotten. I know what it means to be invisible. And I know also what it means to live in that oppression. And so I can like connect that bridge be between oppressed and between free people. So, you know, I hopefully can be helpful to free my people in so many. And so that is my purpose right now. And I'm doing, hopefully I'm doing everything I can do to help my people. And me, I want to thank you really from the bottom of my own heart for having the courage to carry the burden of freedom and to tell the truth. You are a great example and an inspiration to so many of us. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you. It was a real honor.